when there's blood in the streets uh, uh, Lift up, check under the carpet Many try but few become Master of the mark market Well David Williams, thanks very much for coming on Master of the Market Really looking forward to, to sitting down and having a chat And really appreciate you giving me the time Pleasure. I thought we'd start with Kitta Williams, Yeah. by way of background. Can you just explain to us a little bit about what Kitta Williams is and uh, what you guys look to do there? So we're an investment bank and it's pretty simple. We do M&A work and ECM work. So we do takeover work for people and we do capital raising work for people. And uh, our specialty is really food, ag and beverages. So about 70% of our work is in, in the food and ag and beverage sector. Um, and either e ECM or, or um, capital markets or M&A work. So, for example, you know, we might buy Vegemite for bigger cheese, uh, $450 million, then we go and we'll raise $450 million from debt and equity markets. So that's a sort of typical job that we would do. And so there's David Williams, the investment banker, and then there's David Williams, the investor. How do you separate your time between those two pursuits? Uh, well, it just, that just naturally falls out, you know, uh, a whole lot of reasons why it's sort of developed that way you know sometimes we see opportunities that our clients don't want and then we think you know what we know enough about that sector and we'll do it ourselves and then how do you manage the two it just gets just put longer hours in the day that's how it gets managed and how do you describe yourself as an investment i guess in a broad brushstroke sense your, your investment process uh, well, we find things that we believe in and that we can put our hand on our heart and say, yeah, we could do this ourselves. Uh, that's not many deals. You know, if I see 100 different deals a year, maybe I can do one. Yeah. Um, there's a deal in most things we see for somebody, but not necessarily for us. So the question is, can we, can we manage it in the sense of either bringing it back from the dead, if it was sort of in receivership, for example, like Tassel was, we bought Tassel out of receivership for $42 million. Um, there's an example where... I had been the advisor to Tassel on and off over the years for 10 years, so I knew the business pretty well. And when it went into receivership, um, you know, one public company asked us to work for them and then didn't want to pay the fee, so we walked. Um, and then another big US company asked us to work for them and then they didn't want the whole of the business and they walked. So I said, you know what, let's do it ourselves, which is what we did. So we bought it and then floated it in order to, in, in, in order to pay for it. But each deal is different. I guess you, you see things in investments that other people don't see and perhaps things that aren't immediately obvious. And then looking back at your investment history, becomes clear the way you structure deals up is well, quite unique, certainly different to how a pure investor would structure up a deal, whereby you often get your capital back in such a, uh, such a quick time. It feels like that investment banking plays a really important role in your investing as well. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. I was an academic for 10 years, teaching finance in various universities. So I come with an academic background and I look at some of the things we see as an academic exercise as much as anything else. And then you superimpose on that what I call um, investment banking 101, you know, where you really have to add value. So separate out investment banking where we do execution stuff. Somebody comes and says, David, we want to buy this company, go buy it for us and structure it and so forth. That's just pure execution. Really 101 investment banking is where you have to go out with your own idea, figure out something novel, then sell it to a board of directors and then execute it. So it's those first two steps that I think we're pretty good at is, is seeing opportunities where people don't see opportunities. Um, Vegemite's a good example again. It, there was no process. There was no formal process to start with. We took that out through our own ideas about what would fit with Vega and I won't bore you with what that really was. But, um, you know, we, we, that's 101 investment banking. And that's what we do for ourselves is to think outside the square and see if we can make things work. So maybe talk me through, say, the Green Whistle deal. I've been a user of the Green Whistle in the past, and for anyone who's had a joint hanging out of their, their body, they would have used a Green Whistle when, as they're sitting in the ambulance on the way to hospital. It's a, uh, it's a magical invention. Talk us through the, the evolution of that deal, how you came across it, what you felt when you, you first looked at it and started doing DD, and, and how that, that deal evolved. Well, it's a very long story, so it's sort of well, cut we've got it short time. for you. We've got time. I, I was doing the, the merger of Instatech and Pivot, which is now IPL, which yep. is the largest fertiliser company in Australia and the largest explosives company. At the time, Pivot was going broke and we merged it with Instatech. 
it was owned 70 percent your step was owned 70 percent by orica and one of orica's advisors said to me you know you're a guy who buys businesses on his own i'd already bought tasks so why don't you go and have a look at this company so i went and had a look at it and medical development medical was the name of the was, company and that's or, what it was called yeah you know, medical developments and um it had been started by an anaesthetist who had uh, recently retired had worked at royal melbourne as an anaesthetist and uh, he was a bit of an inventor and he took an old drug and repurposed it. That's and he already is had it. Is it pethidine, the drug? What's the actual no, drug a, you're breathing the in? The drug is is a drug called methoxyfluorone, and yeah. we make it out here in in Scoresby in a in a brand new factory. And uh, I went and had a look at it, and he already had it in a couple of the ambulance services, but he didn't have it in the whole of Australia. He certainly didn't have it overseas. And I looked at it carefully, did my own due diligence. I thought, you know what, this is the sort of thing that if you threw enough money at it, um, you could really make it work. Just as an aside, you know, we've probably got 150 listed pharma companies in this country, right? And probably 90% of them will go broke. Mm. Not because the science is bad. The science is fantastic. But because people hold the science like this and they die by a thousand cuts because they don't raise enough money. Mm. So I looked at this and I thought, you know what? If I raise enough money for this and really threw some resources at it and, and, and took it to another place, we could have this anywhere in the world, which is largely what, what happened. So I took it. And this is how the deal was structured, just so everybody knows, this is how our mind works, right? I, it was actually making $1 million pre-tax. I paid him $10.5 million for that business, 10 and a half. So it was a good price at the time. Nobody was getting ripped off. So no IP protection, just to jump in, like the drug was repurposed. Well, was some, there IP around how the, the drug was being ingested? There was some loose IP around the delivery mechanism, because yeah. you know it gets delivered in a, like a green whistle. Yes. Um, and there's some trade secrets and that in terms of how it was being manufactured because okay. we'd got new technology working with CSIRO to, to manufacture the drug. We've now got even newer technology which takes it to another level. Um, and there's some IP that goes with that. But I, but that feels like a pretty cheap purchase price for a, yeah. a pharma company that's already profitable. Well, but it was it was 10 times. Yeah. And uh, so I think it was, it, it was not ripping anybody off in yeah. other words, right? Um, so I bought it for 10 and a half and then in order, but I bought it in this way. I said, look, there's the price subject to finance and subject to DD. So what have I got in corporate finance terms? I've got a free option. Yeah. So I go out, I do my DD and I go, this is, I can make this into something. So I go to the institutions and a half a dozen Melbourne institutions, the usual sort of fund managers. And I said, do you want to be in? They, they all said yes. And I said, well, I'm floating it at 16 and a half. Roughly, these numbers were a bit vague now because it's lost in the mist of time. But the short story is I end up with about 37, 38% for free. Yeah. I haven't put a cent in. And what, over what time, over a couple of month period, you... No, just for the float, I've got 38% for free. Yeah. So I'm floating it for 16 and a half to pay somebody 10. Yeah. So people put in the 10, but they only get 72, so yeah. 62 or whatever. So, so that's what happens. Straight away, the stock takes off. I raise some more money. And we go from, I had a business that I bought that didn't have a managing director, didn't have a marketing person, didn't have a QA or a reg person, nothing, right? But it just was an old repurposed drug that mm. was made in a factory out at Springfield. So we changed all that and made it into a, a real company. Now, if you fast forward to today, sorry, and because I was profitable and it remained largely profitable, I took my dividends as uh, in DRPs. So until last year, the year before, I ended up with 52%. Mm. I haven't paid anything for it. Mm. There are that. And the market cap of medical developments is now? No, it's 750 million. Amazing. So in the last couple of years, we've got into the EU. We've only rolled it out so far in Britain, Ireland, uh, France, Belgium, and like, a couple of weeks ago into Italy. So we've been a bit slow rolling it up. We get, want to get it right. It's not all us. We've got distributors there. So, but it's $750 million from a company that was $10 million, mm. and which I don't, as, a, as an investor, don't have to pay anything. So... You know, the, the amount of money you can get by developing a free carry is, is you know, you've got an infinity return. What's, mm. your, what's your capital invested? Zero. Yeah. What's your profit? Well, it's, it's infinity, you know. And um, so that's the way to, that we look at deals. And, I mean, we've got a pretty big book now, as you can imagine. So we can afford to put money into deals, and we, and we often do. But still, it's a, it's a very handy thing to do as an investor or as an investment banker where you've got deal flow to ask yourself this question. If the deal is so good, then it should be able to carry me in a free way. Mm. That's it. If the deal is really good, I should be able to get a free carry. If the deal's no good and I'm just investing it, you know, just at the margin, okay, I'm going to have to put money in at the same price as everybody else. But it's just like when I bought Tassel. I bought Tassel for 42 and a half at a receivership and roughly floated it. Same thing. Subject to DD, subject to funding. 
So and what sort of time frame do you have before that exclusive period? That all happened in like three months. Yeah. For both of them, it yeah. was about three months. And um, you make everybody cut their cloth. So the lawyers have to take a cut on their fees and the accountants have to take a cut on their fees. On the basis that if it gets away, you gross them up. Mm. So everybody comes out a winner. But, you know, in both of those cases, you know, which are high profile cases now, Tassel in particular is now worth probably 700 million. I haven't looked in the last mm. day or two. But, you know, I got 20% for free. For free. Do you get it? Like, yeah. And, and it was really, on, when that was sold, it was quite unique because it was a worldwide tender for an aquaculture business. Now, if you go into Collins Street today and you say to anybody, aquaculture, people, the first thing they think is, that's a business of the future. Mm. So trying to do a raising for what, for a business that everybody thinks is a business of the future is, is, is a cinch. And you took board seats with, you took a board seat with Tassel. Chairman. And Medical Development. Chairman. And Polly Novo. Chairman. Is that your preferred option to yeah. to stay on the board? No, my preferred option is not to stay on the board. In fact, I'm a firm believer that I'm not a career director. Yeah. I don't want to be a career director. Um, but when I've got such a significant investment in it, I want to fashion it, get it into shape, get the right amount of money in there and get the right management in, and then I'm happy to get out, Yeah, which is what I did with Tassel, for example. Um, so I'm not a career director. I think I'm a firm believer that in all, everybody on the board, for that matter, once you've had, been on a board for two or three years, in my opinion, and especially for me, I've given everything I've got to give. Yeah. I can't tell you anything new, you know? So it's better I go and let somebody else come in. And I think my other philosophy is that as a business grows, it becomes a completely different animal. Mm. You know, you look at Tassel today, I'm off the Tassel board, but they're now into prawns and they're now into exports and they're doing a lot of things that we weren't doing with others. The business becomes a different beast as medical developments was. If you're just selling to a, a bunch of ambulances in Australia, great. But now I'm selling into France and Belgium and Ireland and, and South Africa and uh, you know Mexico. And so you need people who've got skills in marketing and international marketing and, inter and, and regulatory and, and quality and so forth. And I believe in sort of having active boards as well. So I want a board where people aren't management but they've got such experience and it's such a breadth of experience on the board that they can help management by opening doors and giving them a different strategic in input and so forth. That's what I want my boards to be. And so do you run into any issues there? If you want, want a board that's making a lot of suggestions to management and really actively involved, do you ever get pushback from the management where they don't feel they have the autonomy that they desire? No, because if you've got the best in, of breed on your board, yeah. no rational person is going to push back. You, you, I mean, this is a collegial thing as well. There's nobody in the board beating some management up. They're, on the contrary, they're saying, listen, if you're going to do Germany, think about this mm. and think about this. And if they come to look at our plant, think about this. So it's, it's free advice, mm. you know, and collegial advice. So it's, I don't ever see people taking that badly, you know. And so you invest, you invest your money, but then you really invest much more than that in terms of time and rolling your sleeves up to get behind these companies. Yeah. What are some of the things you look for in the founders that you invest in or the management teams you invest in that give you comfort these are someone I want to partner with and, and grow with into the future? My first priority is to make sure I've got a viable commercial business. I don't really care too much about the founders. It's because you can change them, you can't change them. You can change them. them you yeah. know. In the case of Tassel, it's in receivership. Yeah. The management have gone. You know, and quarter men through running a receivership, they put one of their guys in to run it. So I'm not looking at yeah. the key management. Now, as it turned out, I made the CEO, Mark Ryan, who was the who was the quarter mentor delegate, a partner at quarter mentor, and he's still there. So um, if I look at Polynova, for example, people asked me to go in there and see if I could fix it up. And I did that and it required a new management team. So uh, I'm, I'm, when I, before I went in there, I looked, did my own due diligence on the business, thought, you know what? This is not, this is an, un, an unbelievable business. You know, pe people are saying, and if you look at hot copper, people are they're saying this could be another CSL. Well, I don't think that, but you know what? It's already $2 billion coming. So I went in at seven cents a share. It's now $3 and seven today. So people who, who've been there for the ride, the short ride, have uh, 10, 50 times their money, you know, it's unbelievable. So, but the thing about it was, it was only, not only a fantastic product, it actually saves lives. Mm. The old technology was you come in with a burn on your face, take some skin off your ass, put it on your face, it takes. But as it takes, it shrinks all up. So it's really disfiguring. With us, you come in, we put our foam on your face, staple it in, and in a month, and it's so malleable, you can actually keep your facial expressions exactly that. So malleable that in a month or so, it's gone. It just disintegrates. And you're left with the 
fantastic dermis, as good as when you were a baby, you know. So it's cosmetically fantastic. But the thing is, though, that it also saves lives. So if you look at these burn victims out of fires or the volcano victims out of New Zealand, most of those people had our product. Now, we had people with 90% burns to their body. Now, in the old parlance, if you came into a hospital with, say, 50% burns to your body, you're going to die. That's it. There's no way of saving it because you haven't got enough skin to put on you, mm. number one. And there's a whole lot of other problems about covering the body and, and making it. We had a guy in um, Adelaide about six months ago, had 95% burns to his body, right? So cover him in our phone. The guy's at home walking around now. Okay, still having skin grafts, but this build, rebuilds the dermis. And then it gives the doctor months, two months, three months to actually generate enough skin in order to put the skin grafts and close, close the wound. So it's... It's an unbelievable company. It's not, I don't know of any other company in the country that saves lives is cos or at worst is cosmetically beautifying. Um, have, what else do you want? And it makes, a, it makes money, you know? It's like a gift. <laughs> and there's some competitors around that have a biological product used from animal insides that do a similar thing as opposed yeah. to the synthetic product that Polynovo yeah, use. How do you feel about those challenges? Do you think Polynovo is going to be successful? with their product in the it end. It is being s successful. So it's a cheaper product, but it's still very expensive product. Yeah. So the margins are huge, um, but we're much cheaper than some of the competitors. So a major competitor in the US is a company called Integra, and it uses a biological product. So, and there's one in New Zealand, Aroa, which is about to list in Australia, and it uses a biological product. So the biological product in that case is to take a, a sheep's gut and clean it and freeze dry it and slice it. And when you look at the two products, if you just look in a photo of them, they look like the same, basically. But with biological products, there's a number of disadvantages with them. Um, partly they're biological. So what happens is if, if I give you my a heart transplant, for example, there might be a 25, 30% chance that you're gonna reject it. It's the same with skin. So you could put a biological product on your skin or on your wound, and, and maybe in 25% of the cases it rejects. It rejects and it puffs it up or whatever, you take it off, put ours on, no problem. So, so surgeons in the, in the US, if, you, if the institutions call them up, which they do before they invest, the, many of the doctors say this is just revolutionizing the way in which not burns, but wound and surgery are, are undertaken. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a no brainer for most, most yeah. surgeons. And already, even though we started selling in the US probably in August, maybe 18, so here we are, year and a half on more or less. Yeah, we're now selling into the best hospitals in the US. I'm talking about Harvard, I'm talking about Mayo Clinic, I'm talking about UCLA, UC Davis, but the best with the best surgeons, you know. I don't say that just, you know, in my own opinion. The, the, what people acknowledge as the key opinion leaders are in those hospitals and they're early adopters. And like in Germany, you know, we, we only got approval in the, in the EU in 16th of December, we announced it. And already, you know, we've got one doctor who's done four patients already, you know. So, and what we're also seeing in the States is we're seeing people using it in a, in a sense off label. So we've got a, a product that we thought would be for burns, but there was a conference, the World um, Diabetes Conference, I think in Washington a couple of months ago, and a couple of doctors out of one of the better universities in the US had taken some diabetic patients mm. that had lo diabetic foot ulcers. So, you know, one of the problems with diabetes, sometimes you get, you know, you get gangrene and you get ulcers and so forth. I remember seeing one graphic of a guy with a, with a wound on the bottom of his foot that had been there for three years. And you can look up these papers and it's just red, it's just flesh mm. around a normal skin. So can't cure it. Okay, cut out a circle of ours, put it in the wound, staple it in, month later, job done. Right. So we're seeing, you know, a lot of people using it for things, not that we didn't intend it to be used for that, but rather that um, they take their own life, you know, in the same way as Botox takes its own life, you know, with proof of something, but now it's used for facial fillers and, and so on and so forth. So changing gears, talking about agriculture, what opportunities are you seeing in agriculture in Australia, do you think, in the next sort of 10, 15, 20 years that are exciting to you? Agriculture is changing all the time. And when we bought Vegemite a couple of years back for Vega, I thought the dairy industry had just dealt itself out. Everything's gone. So what are we going to do? Well, let's find something else in the supermarket that brings us some other advantages. So Vegemite not only was an iconic product, it was a profitable product. We thought we could buy it cheaply, but it also brought to Vega a huge sales and marketing force. Okay. Put that aside, we think that's one of the drivers for why we thought that was an attractive acquisition. 
two years on, look what's happening. Bellamy's is in play. Mm. Lions is still in play. Um, you know, the Chinese are still here trying to buy other stuff. There's a lot of small dairy assets that, you know, haven't got into the, into the public sort of notice yet, but the whole thing's open again. Mm. Um, fun, there's talk about Fonterra and where they're going to be with their Australian business. Two years ago, I thought it was all done and mm. now it's, everything's available. So, so it's not possible just to be definitive in just about every category. Like we're doing a lot of work in dairy at the moment. We're doing a lot of work in red meat at the moment. So the red meat guys have been making out like bandits for the last year and a half. Why? Because of the drought. So what's in the drought? The farmers throw off all their animals. The animals get cheaper. The guys who are cutting and killing it, they're making a lot of money. Well, now we've got the rain. Guess what? The animal price has gone up even in the last week mm. and will continue to go up because, you know, the, the cattle are getting more expensive because the farmers don't want to throw them off anymore. They're trying to get their herd back. I was watching a show last night on television. Some guy was there saying, I used to have 12,000 animals. I've now got 400 and now it's raining. He said, what I'm thinking about at night is how do I buy another 8,000 animals? Mm. Well, those 8,000 animals he's buying aren't going to the slaughterhouse, which means that, you know, the price of cattle that the slaughterman has to pay are going to go through the roof. How are you feeling about the beyond meat, fake meat phenomenon? Um, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a thing of the future. I think it'll carve out a nice 10%, 20% you know, part of the market. It's playing to you know, the increasing you know, interest in vegan and, and so forth. Um, I don't think it'll ever you know, take over red meat, but it'll get a nice, little, uh, a nice little niche for itself. But look, it's everywhere. Could you ever see yeah. yourself sitting down at Flower Drum ordering the uh, Beyond Meat and Black Bean well, stir fry or something like that? I'm going to answer it in this way. I've got 3,700 acres <laughs> north of the airport, 25k north of the, and I've got David Blackmore Wagle in it. So <laughs> when I go to the Flower Drum, I eat my own beef. <laughs> it, it's very interesting to ask a question about, say, fake meat or non-meat meat. You know, The more interesting thing about what's happening with everything else. So Syro in particular has got unbelievable technology now where they're making cheese from yeast. Yeah. Right? They're making cannabis from yeast. So, you know, this technology means I don't care what's in the paddock. I don't care whether it's a drought or not a drought. And I can replicate it, you know, ad infinitum. So it's just a matter of making sure the cost is right. So we're going to see a lot of, we're going to see a lot of beverages and we're going to see a lot of foods, dairy in particular, um, and probably seafood and other things, which are made from other, yeah. other than, so most of that meat's made from peas. Yeah. It's all pea protein. And then you color it in a different way and you put the blood in in a different way, you know, so it's, that's all beautiful, but there's plenty of, there's pl plenty of competitors. And really, no real IP protection for any of the, no, the companies I mean, offering is there. There's a hundred companies around the world doing meat, meatless meat, you know. If you were to, if you were to follow this train of thought, so the idea that ultra low interest rates have been deflationary and they've been deflationary for things like flat screen TVs or yeah. cars or things that man can create more of yeah. or woman can create more of, that, and they've been inflationary for asset prices, yeah. particularly, you know, even in the US with all the buybacks, th oh. things that are scarce yeah. or you can't be more of land, asset prices. In terms of food production, yeah. do you think the environment of ultra low interest rates, does food fit in the category now of something that man can create more of because yeah. it's easy to use those ultra low interest rates to spend on the technology to increase your yield of fruit or vegetable, et cetera? Or do you think it fits in the camp of something that is inflationary because it's hard to make more of? I think it fits more in the camp of inflationary. Okay. I think there's two, there's two camps here. First of all, you've got the guys who produce food. Yeah. And may, in the main, they're just doing what they always did. You know, they're not necessarily looking at new technology. They're looking at a lot of R&D for their own you know, businesses. Yeah. You know, if you're an almond producer, for example, of course you're looking at new technology in bee and pollination yeah. and, and, and culling and cracking and using the waste yeah, and yeah. all that sort of stuff. But over here, there's all this stuff in the universities and CSIRO and yeah. so forth that it might be producing the similar sorts of proteins that in a different way. You know, and yeah, we haven't seen as much crossover yet as I would like to see between that. Now we are seeing some, and I think one of the biggest, single biggest trend in the last couple of years, if you look at the food companies around the world, is that every single major food company is now buying into startups. Into, and I mean multiple startups, you know, so it'll be Unilever, or it'll be Mondelez, or it'll be Coca-Cola. In if I, if I went to Coca-Cola five years ago, and I said to it, I shouldn't use Coke as a good example because we act for them as well, but, but just any major CEO, and this isn't a bad thing, and you went to them with a business that sounded, this is a real good startup, this is great, right? CEO would inevitably say to you, look, it's great, but it's too small for us. Yeah. It'll get lost in here. 
yeah, we turn over three billion. You're bringing me something that turns over two million. Come back in three years. And if it's right, if you're right, and I think you are right, David, it'll probably be worth 300 or 400 million. I'll be happy to play it. That's how people treated it. Now, people have got sick of all that. And so those bigger acquisitions of number one dried up a little bit. Number two aren't performing that well. So everybody's taking a bet on startups. So if you went to any major company in the US in the last year alone, they would have all made at least a dozen bets, two million, three million, four million, five million, and trying to find that next big thing, the next big, you know, if I was a Coca-Cola, the next big um, beverage that does have good gut bacteria, for example. And are they after the marketing now, so the energy of a startup, or is it the tech no. that they're usually after? Well, what's after what's the, the driving? Tech. You're after the tech. Yeah. Because And what you're after is to get, let's say I was a Coca-Cola, let's say I could imagine a product that would be a world beater in terms of what it's going to do to your gut. Yeah. Okay, these guys who have invented that, they're typically not good marketers and they don't know how to get to market. And by the way, they can't get to the channel anyway. Mm. But if they team up with a Coke who says, I've got 10,000 fridges in Sydney alone, 10,000. If I were to put your bottle in those 10,000, your turnover goes through the roof. So, you know, one of the great things about some of these companies, of course, is their marketing now, uh, their R&D, and their ability to get into a channel. And you can't, you can't do that when you're a startup, no matter how good you are. Well, it's been made about Chinese buying up farms around Australia. Do you think that's been overplayed and the risk it poses to Australia? Or do you think that's a real issue that, that the country needs to be taking seriously? No, I don't think it's an issue at all. I mean, it, it's, uh, first of all, I think it's drying up. Yeah. So not only for the coronavirus, but in the last year, we've seen a lot of deals start to dry up where, you know, the Bank of China or somebody's preventing them getting the money out of China. So I think the coronavirus is just going to accelerate that a bit. So we're, we're seeing a lot of that drying up and the bits and pieces that you're still seeing, the people have got money already in Hong Kong or here already. So they don't need to go through the formal processes. But in the main, you know, getting money out of China is now very hard. And we're seeing less and less of um, just sporadic purchases you know you, you could have a, a vineyard you could have a beef farm and it's being bought by a guy that's got a plastic pipe factory in northern china well it doesn't make sense you know but it's just a trophy mm. um for some people it's also a way of getting money out of china so you know who cares in some ways what you pay um, and definitely the prices have been inflated because you know it's spare cash it's a means of getting money out of china etc cetera, etc cetera. but all that's going to stop and and if it hasn't already stopped so, but for those who bought it, I don't care. And it's been good because in ev nearly every case, the Chinese owners have spent money on capital. And, you know, the best thing that can happen is they make a lot of money. I'm happy with that and they give a lot of employment. If they go broke, well, who cares? The farm is now much better capital-wise and mm. much better structured. And some Australian will buy for half the price, which is literally what happened in the late 80s. So in the late 80s, we went through this with the Japanese. You pick, couldn't pick up the paper without you know, complaints about the Japanese buying up half of Australia, including most of the meat assets, and then all, of, all the assets up the Queensland coast in terms of resorts and so forth. Well, nearly all that's gone. I mean, there's still a few little investments in the meat industry, but in the main, it's gone. And having said that, you know, what they delivered back to Australia was much better assets that mm. could be bought at a cheap price. And get this, Japan's still our biggest trading partner for meat. So we might have lost them in ownership, but we kept them in terms of markets, you know. So I'm not worried about it at all. I welcome the, I welcome the Chinese with open arms, you know. And I can point you to, say, meat assets. I can point you to other assets which have been shut for five or ten years, right? Nobody there. And somebody comes along and says, I'm going to open that abattoir. I'm going to put 200 guys on the boning line. I'm going to spend $50 million on it. How long does it take you to say yes to that? Yeah. Put out the welcome mat, <laughs> yeah, put on the outside light and just embrace that, is what I say. But Canberra, on the other hand, you know, wants to make it, you know, it's the FIRB is not the FIRB, it's become the CIRB, the China Investment Review Board. You know? yeah. And um, we're sort of pushing them away and we, we need to fix this, not just from an investment point of view, but you know, there's, this, there's this schism between the Australian and the Chinese government now at the highest levels. And if we don't fix it, it's not going to be good for investment. Do you, you mentioned coronavirus there. Have you done much work looking into it? Do you think it has a long-lasting effect or do you think any cost is sort of a V-shaped bounce? I've got, I got, I got no idea, but it's going to be devastating for a lot of food companies in this country, the smaller ones. Yeah. And I'll tell you why, because, it, look, we don't know whether it's going to last another month or three months or four months. When it's finally contained, it'll bounce back. We know that from looking at what happened with SARS. You know, It'll bounce back pretty quickly. But 
Unfortunately, what's happened in the last five years is we've all been fixated on China. So every state politician, every federal politician has been up there multiple times and we've got all these small little companies that are doing infant formula and a whole lot of fresh food stuffs and all that sort of stuff into China. It's their only customer, some mm. of them. So, okay, what happens now is there's nobody working at the port. The factories aren't working. And so if you're a guy who's producing food and it's only for China, you're, you're stuffed because you're typically not that big. So you don't have the capital to support yourself. You can't just sort of go, well, let's go away for two, uh, two weeks holiday mm. and I'll leave all my berries in the fridge, you know, or, or whatever it happens to be. So you, that means you've got to dump it on the world market. Well, guess what? Every other person can't get into China either. So a lot of these prices are coming off. So, you know, it's going to be terrible, I think, for you know, a large number of small food companies in Australia. There'll be a real shakeout on this, even if, it only, even if they fix it in a month from now. Is that right? Months. Yeah, absolutely. I think the near term for a lot of foodstuffs is not not great. Could be a few opportunities for Kitty Williams to uh, could be on the rural. But again, you, you need you see. Let's say you've got a business that's been supplying China only. It's not just an easy thing to say. I'll go and get it. Uh, that's a cheap buy. Well, it might be a cheap buy, but where am I going to put it? Yeah. I might, my skills are not international distribution either. But somebody who has it, there'll be some opportunities. You know, to say you know I could take all that product and I'll put it into France or somewhere else. You know. And so if you look forward the next 10, 20 years, we touched on ag investment and the opportunities that may arise there. What sort of macro themes do get you really excited? Because I know you're in tech, we'd rate my age. And what, what, what do you see the future as? And where are some well, of the opportunities that... Well, I think the, the things... Well, first of all, if I just had my M&A hat on, I think there's going to be an enormous number of opportunities in this whole food without food sort of this whole tech area you know dairy without dairy meat without meat yeah um, and the tech that's coming out of algae and seaweeds and you know a whole lot of other things that have not really been in our in our vocabulary before. gut bacteria is at the yeah. front and center gut, of a lot of those products. everything's being driven by gut yeah that what is happening to the microbiome in your gut and what we're going to see very quickly very quickly in tech terms means in the next 10 years, mm. but we're going to see personalized diets. So we've already got some good stuff around now here and in the US where I can take your poo and I can test it and I can say, right, you need more of this and you need more of that um, in order to get your whole body up. And, and it's very clear now that there's a strong connection between what's in your gut and what's going on in your head. So the connection between neurology and, and gut health. So that's going to be a huge area. No, for, on the stock exchange as well. So yeah. there's some good things up. There's one that's going to be floated next week called Micro Bar. It, it should be a tear away, you know, using U, U of Q, University of Queensland tech. But there's some great stuff in the US as well. So that's going to link into the whole food chain thing. And we're going to see a lot more of that. Sort of muddying the water between food and medicine. They yeah. reckon sort yeah. of like not quite well, medicine, but not quite it's just it's, standard it's, food. The way I like to think of it is making nutraceuticals a bit more uh, a bit more honest, you know, yeah. and uh, being able to sort of prove the effects of some of this stuff. But look, everybody, but everybody is going to be looking to, when, as this refines itself up, put some of this stuff in their food. You know, even if it's just simple, I don't know, omega-3s or something in a bar of Cadbury chocolate, that is coming. And, and I know that the people, for example, who make Cadbury are already thinking about that, you know. So that's going to happen in every, everything. So that's one of the big areas. But when you you start from that and you sort of waterfall down, then you get into um, you know, meat without meat and, and all of those other things and how does that sort of affect, affect the thing. So there will, there's an increasing crossover between um, you know, nutraceuticals and food and pharmaceuticals and food and, and that will go into personalised diets. So that's one really exciting area. I think the other exciting area which most companies have been really bad at over the last 50 years is what you do with your waste. So every food company has waste. And um, you know, what we've got out of the tightening of environmental laws and so forth is you've got a lot of pressure on companies to find a home for that waste. And guess what? When you start to think about it, you find products that you used to just throw down the drain, you know. And I mean when, when I bought Tassel, for example, I used to pay somebody, you know, thousands of dollars to take away my frames, a fish frame. So I'd get a fish out of the water, cut the salmon off it, and I'm left with a, a, a skeleton in a head, right? You've got a pay somebody to take that and put it into landfill. Now that goes into a, into a process which takes all the oil out of it, makes some of it into fish meal, makes some of it into animal food and makes it into oil that might go into a vitamin C tablet, for example. You know? So everywhere you go, 
um, the almond guys. You know, you hull and crack the almond, take the almond out. That's what you used to sell. Now, what happens is you, you can do things with that hull. You can turn it into power, but you can turn it into pig food. And, and you watch as we start to refine up our knowledge of these things. All that waste will turn into something. Mm. And the interesting thing is, it's like the meat guys, the interesting thing is a lot of that waste becomes more profitable than the, than the key product. Mm. So if I look at my abattoir guys, if I went back 20 years, those abattoir guys, you go and see somebody kill an animal. You know, a lot of the offals went to the, the landfill, the blood went down the drain. Now, well, everything's collected. People make money off that now, and really good money. There's a big factory up at, at uh, outside of um, Tatura that used to be the old Heinz factory. And if you go and stand up there, every half an hour, there's a B-double comes in, and it's full of food mm. that was off spec. You know, somebody ran into a whole lot of cans and dented them so they can't be sold. But he's, let's say a, a B-double of peaches comes in from SPC. He opens the cans, he takes the peaches out, he crushes the cans and sells all the tin, so he gets all that money back. And he puts the peaches to dairy farms or cattle or something else. And each of those products he has, has a different use. So we're going to see a lot more refinement in that whole waste, whatever waste you're talking about. It's an economy wide thing with Airbnb with houses. It's sort of not unique to just the well, food industry, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. I don't call Airbnb waste, but you, you know what you're talking about is let's it's underutilized use asset, capacity. isn't it? Correct. Yeah, I mean cars are yeah. probably the last asset people own, yeah. which are really underutilized. That Correct. You suspect there'll be some changes there in a generation to come. You know, when we bought, we bid on Warner Cheese and Butter for Bega, and uh, one of the things that came out of the due diligence of that was that for a period of time, Warner themselves were just spray drying, you know, the whey and some of the waste onto the, onto the paddocks. Why not? It's a natural product. Who cares? And uh, but there's a lot of sandstone down there. They had a license to do this, by the way, from mm. the, the mines department. I'm sort of making up these dates, but let's say in 1950, they got a license. They've been doing it ever since. Well, when people started to look at Warrnambool, guess what? They found out that that way was sinking into the sandstone, which is in Warrnambool, and it was coming out, let's say, 10K into the ocean, and the whales are feeding on it. You know, so people were like, you can't do that anymore, you know. Mm. I thought it was quite good, actually. I getting the whale. Everyone thought the whales were just coming around to breed. They'll probably come around to have a milkshake. But, but anyway, so that sort of had to stop. But I'm just giving you an example where, you know, in some environment you think, I just, who gives a rip? Put it down the drain, put it on a yeah. pad. No, no necessary damage done in some cases. But there's, when you force people not to do it, they said, I can cut that way and I'm going to do some of it for sportsmen, some of it for muscle builders, some yeah. of it for baby formula. Yeah, you can start to cut in, and slice the salami so that you might get half a dozen products out of what used to be waste. Mm. And the more tech you put into that, the more you're going to find some interesting things, you know. It's been brilliant. I might finish with three questions, if you don't mind. What was your first ever investment? I can't recall. It's so long ago. It doesn't matter. I mean, no, I <laughs> It was obviously I mean, a dog. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I've always done okay. But no, but I mean, I took investing seriously when I, when I started with Tassel. Yeah. And then I went... So that was your first serious, really serious investment was Tassel. Yeah. What advice would you have investing-wise or otherwise to your 18-year-old self? I'd probably build my skill base quicker than I did. In terms, you know, understanding the fundamentals of valuation is the first thing. And then finding good mentors to show you how businesses link together. There's plenty of people in the accounting firms and the investment banks who can model yourself to death, Mm. right? But it's the ability to think outside that square and show the linkages between companies is where you sort of make money. And what's the most common mistake you see retail investors make? Oh, just the herd mentality. Listening to their brokers, that'll be number one. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm well, joking. There's not much alternative for them, you know. That's a, it's a pretty good place to finish up. David Williams, thanks very much for, uh, for coming on Master the Market. Okay, no problem. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest. <laughs> Many try but few become Master of the mark market, market. 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 market.